Welcome to the show. I'm Kim Parley. It is great to have you with us. My first guest is a trader who's delved into an area many fear to tread, options trading. Sarah Potter is the founder of SheCanTrade.com and author of How You Can Trade Like a Pro. I sat down and spoke with her earlier about her start as a trader and her interest in puts and calls. Fascinating conversation. So I used to get up early in the morning and I'd trade the euro um, way too early. <laughs> uh, so that wasn't sustainable either because that was too early in the morning. Um, so yeah, I used to do that and I did a lot of futures trading before that and then would go to work and then would try to do stocks whenever I could all around that. Um, and it, then it just started piquing my interest and I kind of started delving into options. Um, to just traditionally, we hear about options trading by buying stocks and you sell covered calls. So certainly dabbled in that as well and started getting thinking like, yeah, I'm going to do this. How how can I be even more active in it? How can I be uh, a better participant in the market? Uh, and so I started then testing out different strategies and specifically really loving and honing in on uh, trading options with multi-leg strategies. There had to have been a leap from the time you said, okay, I'm going to buy, you know, Nortel or, or whatever it was to say, I'm going to start, you know, futures and euro. So what was that? Was it just interest or you just, you just thought if someone else could do it, I can do it too? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I am... A, for good or bad, I'm a determined individual. Yeah. And I just kind of felt like, well, wait a second, if all of these big institutions, if all these big traders can do this, why can't I learn to do it too? And it was really just that perseverance of going back and testing out strategies to finding ways that would work. And that's really where I got intrigued with futures because futures can be very appealing because you can make a lot of money, you can also lose a lot of money, um, but you can do that in, the, in a day. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was a great way to basically trade before I had to go to work. Um, now for me personally, that wasn't feasible long term and that's where I moved into trading options because I wanted an ability to be able to trade without having to be stuck. I mean some mornings I would look at the euro and there'd be nothing so I have just got up and sat there for two hours and done nothing and that's just not it wasn't a productive use of my time whereas in options trading because we have so many different strategies I can look and set strategies up go away and do something else come back see if I got filled etc. It's just a little bit more laid back uh, which really suits my perspective personality and also allows me to have two young kids uh, and be able to still be quite active in the market. Talk a bit about the choices because you know uh, I, I obviously I think people who, who, who watch and know are into the markets and you hopefully with stocks buy low sell high and everything's fantastic. You know that's okay if the, the stocks are moving on an upward trajectory. With options you have choices for directionally from a time standpoint. What are the different kinds of options traders as you see them and what they can do? Yeah, so there are so many choices and options and, and I think sometimes people feel a little overwhelmed by all that choice. But if you think about it really in two columns. So the one column is your traditional options trading and then you also have a little bit more active trading and those are people who might be trading looking at an option and thinking or an underlying that it's just moving sideways. Mm -hmm. And so you trade the, with the assumption that it's not going anywhere and then there's your options trading that you think it is going somewhere. So if you think about it only in two columns it's not that scary. Um, and then if you think about the strategies there's a lot of them that are involved in, in looking at an underlying and it not moving that also increases the probability of success of your trades. So for me when I'm in the market I'm not looking for a needle in the haystack. I'm looking for trades I can place every single day. So generally every day I'm getting in trades and I'm getting out of trades. You talked a bit about before when we were chatting with the bullseye, which I thought was a really interesting analogy. Tell me a bit about how you see that and, and you know, from, from, from what an investor is trying to do. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the market and you're trying to find what are you going to do, right? Like I want to be involved in the market. What can I do? Um, you can always look for the trade that is going to um, change everything. So like the, the bullseye trade or the you know triple your money trade but those are those are low probability those are going to happen to you but you can't get those to work every single day right. so when I go to the market I want to look for trades that have higher probability so what I would rather do by the end of the month is have a collection of trades that I've placed that have all worked out well I mean we're all gonna have some that don't work but mm -hmm. majority of them working out well by the end of the month um, that are higher probability and I look to cash those out put the money in my pocket more often where 
as waiting for those home run trades. Um, to me, that's just not being efficient in the market. I want to use my money because I want to be an active trader. It's almost, I mean, to me when you're saying this, it sounds like you know, you're know you generating ongoing income, making single base hits kind of thing, as opposed to always trying to swing for the fences and get those big ones. Yeah, and I think if you look at the market, I mean, and I look at my trades overall, I'm going to have some, like some are lottery trades, but I want to only take the amount of money that I'm willing to risk as a lottery ticket for those that I really want to win big. And then I want to have the majority of my trades that are like bread and butter trading, that need mm -hmm. to pay the bills kind of stuff. So I want to increase the likelihood of those working out. And you can do that in options because of the different strategies that are out there. So rather than just looking at an underlying, let's say a stock and saying, yeah, I think that's going to go up, um, I can say, you know what, I think that it's more likely that it isn't going to go any lower or that it might actually stay still. So I could do something like a credit spread strategy. So for example, if I said, uh, I'm going to sell a put credit spread. Well, for me to be right on that trade, it can go up, it can go sideways, and it can even go a little bit down, mm. and I've still made money on the trade. Versus if I compare that to a call, that has to go up, and it has to go up enough so that I can make more money. So just increasing the likelihood. Right. So I guess it always starts from the fundamental, where do you think things are going, or what's the most likely outcome, and then how can you structure something around that so you're generating income or generating uh, something from that trade, which I know is a little more complex, because you said that the, 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 the spread, I went, huh, <laughs> okay, we're not there yet. So one of the things that actually happens in options trading, and you know this better than anyone, is just the language that's used around it. I mean, you have you know option chains and legs and um, put call spreads and all sorts of good stuff. Uh, it's, it's dizzying. It is completely intimidating to most people. It is. And you know what? And it's unfortunate because it shouldn't be. Um, and it's funny, actually, just to tell you a story. When I first started, I should have been sponsored by Post-it Note because <laughs> what I actually used to do was have Post-it Notes for every little term that I learned and I didn't know and I'd write the definition down and I had it up on my wall in my office. So certainly not very technical, but that's the inside scoop of what I did. Um, but think about options um, like a language. So you do need to learn the language when you begin, just like you learn any new skills. But you don't need to learn at all at the no, beginning. No, no, yeah. absolutely not. I mean, you, you want to know what you're doing, um, but if you if you don't have the right word for it, I, I don't think that, that really matters. And, and it can become second nature. So I have a three-year-old daughter, and if you ask her what a call is, most of you would probably think it's the phone. And for her, she thinks, no, that's something that mommy's going to buy. Hmm. So it, She's it's, trading. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it certainly can be part of your world. It's just a matter of learning the language. When we come back, more of my conversation with Sarah Potter, trader and author of How You Can Trade Like a Pro. We're going to look at specific techniques and some examples. We're going from theory to practice and what she uses when she's taking a look at trades. You're watching Money Talk. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're going to continue that conversation I was having with Sarah Potter. She's the trader and author of How You Can Trade Like a Pro. And she explains why Apple is an interesting play and how she gathers her trading research. So generally I am holding trades for about three to five days and I look to trade as I said more often throughout that time period. Um, so I'm not a day trader generally. I have some day trades on but mostly swing trading and then I do long-term trading, but that's more for my retirement time accounts. Okay. Um, but my everyday trading is swing trading, about three to five days. Okay. So when I'm looking at an underlying and trying to make a decision about what I want to trade and win, I'm kind of thinking in a time frame of about two to three weeks. Sure, if it hits my profit target in an hour, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. But I want to set it up so that it does have a few days to run to, to where I want it to go. Right. Okay. So let's let's look at the Apple example. You've brought this up, and again, these are not these these are fixed. We've taken these at a point in time. So someone's looking right online. These are not going to be the same prices right now. But at this point in time, what did you see? Why, why is Apple interesting to you? Okay, so first let's talk about how I gather evidence for trading. And everyone's going to do that differently. So there's going to be people in camps that are going to trade with technical analysis, those that trade fundamentals, uh, or you can trade probability. There's all sorts of different ways. And I kind of take the best of everything. So what we're seeing here are charts. So I definitely use charts, especially to help with the, with the direction of where I think something's going. So for me, I'm going to hone in on a daily chart. Okay. And if I look here at Apple on the daily chart, a couple weeks ago, we saw this along with a bunch of tech stocks really sell off. And so since Apple has sold off, we haven't really seen it regain itself. It looks like it's consolidating. So mm. those last few candlesticks are basically moving sideways. And it's stuck around support. There's a bit of support there around 145. Okay. Now for me, because it hasn't really been able to jump right back up again, I think there's some room for Apple to still go a little bit lower. And so I want to take advantage of that, okay, short-term so, trade. And I just want to just pause there. So the belief for you is based on your research and the underlying kind of what you think is going on is that Apple is here, but you still see it going a little bit lower. 
Yeah, so okay. I think over the next three to five days. Yeah, exactly. In okay. the short term, I think that there's a there's a play here to be able to buy a put and to ha see that have some more value in a couple days because I think Apple's going lower. Now buy a put because we haven't talked about that too. So the put is, and again, it depends how deep, but the put is the right to sell the stock, right? Uh, An I'm, option to sell a stock. I'm buying it, yeah. Right, yeah. you're buying the put. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so and that's, to remember, I mean, there's all sorts of terms and options, but there's buying and selling. Right. But what's really important to remember when you're trading options is you're going to have to do something with it mm -hmm. uh, when it expires. Mm -hmm. So just always keep that in mind. Okay. Because eventually it has, you have to do something. Right. Um, so if I want to buy a put, um, I would look at this and look for something that has a bit of value. Um, so if I move into the options chain with Apple, mm -hmm. I am going to uh, look over on the put side, and right now we can get a delta of about 60, uh, 66 for the strike of 148. Okay, so 148 and strike. Okay, so let's go through those things. So 148 price of, of where Apple will be. What is the 66%, the delta you talked about? Okay, so strike relates to the price that is trading over on the stock. The delta is basically at a surface level, the probability of success. So okay. in options trading, we talk about language, there's all sorts of different Greeks. And Greeks are basically helping you with how an option is being priced, mm -hmm. priced in. Uh, so there's all those different ones. And essentially delta is helping you with probability. So if I buy a 148 strike, I'm basically buying a 66% chance that this trade is going to, to work out. Right. It's, it's not that simple, but it's a good service way to look at it, mm -hmm. right? Because within every strike, within every option, there's a value, uh, there's, there's intrinsic value and there's premium, and you're paying for that. So for me, with this trade, I am paying for a little bit of value, but there's certainly still some premium in here. Mm -hmm. So what I essentially want to do is buy something that doesn't cost too much. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the bid and ask on the options chain here, the bid is at 425 and the ask is at 435. Um, so I'd probably try to pick that up probably around $4 or closer to four bucks if I can. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I want to see is Apple go down and then I'm going to sell that put hopefully for, for more and right. make the, the difference. Because that gives somebody else the right to do it at a higher price. You got it already. No. <laughs> I'm slow. Keep going. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's essentially the trade, just looking for that to push down a little bit lower. Um, and I and I think that looks pretty good. Okay. Well, if you were to look at, and you said the, the, the delta on this um, was 66%. Uh, if you go higher up that option chain that we have on the screen, just explain a little bit, like what would we see at the top of that, at the top of that uh, um, option chain? Like in terms of the, the, the higher or lower probabilities. Explain Okay, yeah. So first of all, think about an options chain. It's basically like an auction. So yeah. there's all sorts of people that are going to post what they would like. Mm -hmm. And we are all going to this, just like you're going to the grocery store. You want to go and get a good value for something. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this and I'm trying to find where's the value for me, somebody else is going to go and say, well, where's the value for them, etc. Um, and we also didn't talk about dates, which we probably should do too. Mm -hmm. So within this options chain, I can choose to buy strikes that have value or don't have value. And those are going to relate to the different prices, which is also going to relate to things like delta. We can get into theta, so theta is time decay. We can go to, we can go a All lot sorts deeper. Of good stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, but essentially, I can make a decision about how much am I really willing to risk. Um, if if the 148 gives me a little bit higher delta at a cost that's around four dollars, I'm okay with that. If we look at the options chain and we go to a strike that has more value, so we're going deeper in the money now. Um, you'll look that we've basically doubled the cost to trade it. So I could have the same assumption as the trader that wants to buy the 155 put and I want to buy the 148 put, except for I'm only going to spend about $4 and they're going to spend about $10. Mm. So they're buying something that has more value, right. more probability, but you've also increased the, the amount that you're putting up to place that trade. Right. And I guess that's the piece, I think, especially for retail traders, I'm a retail trader as well, is you always want to consider how much money are you really willing to risk um, in order to make some money because certainly when you buy a call or put, what you're risking is that amount. Right. So if I'm totally wrong here and this yeah. goes the opposite way, it's gone. Then I have no value anymore, mm -hmm. right? Because an option represents something else. So that 148 that I bought for four dollars might be worthless in two weeks if I get it wrong. Now there's other things we can do with it, but that's something to keep in mind as well, especially for retail traders. Are you comfortable putting up four dollars? Are you comfortable putting up ten dollars for the same assumption? Where are you? Where do you like? For me, my sweet spot is generally this delta between 60 and 70. I think it's a nice balance of a bit of value without having to spend too much money to get involved in a directional trade.
That was Sarah Potter, trader and author of How You Can Trade Like a Pro, taking us through some of her ideas around Apple and what she saw as an opportunity right then.